In our home, we set our minds to know about God and his ways. That was about 14 years ago, 12 years ago, and God has never failed to teach us year by year, precept by precept, line upon line, verse upon verse. And he just keeps, keeps downloading to where now it's between 2 and 3 o'clock every morning. George, time to get up. And I get up and go listen and read the word. And when I can't stay awake any longer, I go back to bed. Because he's done with me. But I go to bed worshiping and I can't stop. I can't stop crying out the name of Jesus. I just I lay my head on a pillow and I said, Jesus, Jesus, he's, he's so wonderful. I thank you, Jesus. And when I get out of bed again, so I get out of bed and I say, good morning, Lord, good morning. For about five years now, and about a month and a half ago, I said, good morning, Lord. And I took about one or two steps and I heard a click like Willie turns on a microphone. (laughs) And I heard audibly, good morning, George. (laughs) Click. Two words. Two words. Two words. That was all. Just two. Just two. He's not rude. He heard my good mornings every day. And pretty soon he says, Good morning, George. Click. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. today for the spirit of wisdom, revelation, that the eyes of our understanding, our imagination, the place that you put pictures of what you're doing so that we can visualize and see. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. And Father, we thank you for the fountain that has been opened in Jerusalem to provide for mankind cleansing from sin and total cleansing for any, any iniquity. And we find that also in Ephesians 5, 26 and 27. Jesus' name. So you are receiving a today's handout. The first part of the handout is dealing with today's lesson. And the last pages in the big print are is information that I want you to have in your hands dealing with pre-trib, mid-trib, and post-trib. And in that document, you will find 10 reasons why it's pre-trib and pre-trib only. There are several people that I have used as mentors over the years, but one of the best that I have heard ever on where we are right now, if you go on YouTube and put in Rock Island Books, Rock Island Books, It's a man who knows, and an organization who knows Daniel's 70th week backward and forward. Since I first heard about the tribulation and the rapture, 
maybe, I don't know, 25, 30, 40, a long time ago, I, I said to the Lord, I want to I wanna go. I want to I wanna live, Lord, till I can see the rapture. I want to be a part of it. I want to be a part of it. About seven or eight years ago, he laid on my heart that a part of it would be the timing of it. And since that time, I am convinced that when we hear the trumpet sound and the shout, come up here, it will be at the feast of trumpets. Why that feast? Because the horns would blow calling Israel to prayer or to congregation. Why would he not use the chauffeur to call us home at the Feast of Trumpets? When is the Feast of Trumpets? The Feast of Trumpets occurs in the Hebrew month of Tishri. And it runs, depending on the years, it runs eight, nine, ten days. And it's generally from October 1st to the 10th, the Feast of Trumpets. Rock Island Books is proclaiming openly now to 5.8 million viewers. 5.8 million viewers that we are right at the edge. And I mean right on the precept. It can't go in God's calendar, it can't go much farther. Some say, well, we got to be ready for the rapture. You got to get ready for the rapture. And I've often wondered to myself, how, I do, how do I do that? How, how do I outdo what Jesus did for me as a gift. Well, you got to be ready for the rapture. If you're born again and you and you and or you have called on the name of Jesus, you're ready. You're ready. If you have committed a sin, God's already forgotten it. You're ready. Well, you know I had these kids who Mine, when he was a little boy, eight, nine years old, confessed Jesus in Sunday school, he's ready. Amen. He's ready. Because it's not that we're called because of who we are, it's we're called because who we, he is. Yeah. See, it's got nothing to do with us except opening our mouths and Jesus, how, how about me? Yeah. You're ready. You're ready. You're ready. Now, if I were skilled in the art of manipulation, I believe that I could preach in such a way that say, well, it's grace plus obedience. How much have you been giving lately? Got to be ready for the rapture. Can't buy it. You cannot buy it. You cannot buy it. It's free. Now, will the giving affect you at some time? Absolutely, because we're going to stand at a place called the judgment seat of Christ. 
And he's going to judge us on two criteria. Gold, silver, and precious stones. That's one. Wood, hay, and stubble is the other way. But guess what? Always get saved. Wood, hay, and stubble get saved. The Bible is very specific. Wood, hay, and stubble get saved. But just barely. Just as escaping because the fire is right behind you. And those of us who have tried our best to be obedient to what God has called us to do, that's looked at as gold and silver and precious stones. Where do you find that? Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, and 2 Corinthians and other places. Tonight we'll continue with our series of teachings. It'll help us better understand where we are on God's calendar, possible future events that we may experience during the days of head, ahead. Understand that we have had several calendars that people have given God credit for that has nothing to do with God. Has a lot to do with Romans and the dictators in Rome. Had a lot to do with the Catholic Church and some of the popes in the Catholic Church because they could make a calendar fit with their theology. It doesn't work that way. The calendars that we use need to be the one that God uses. If he says 7,000 years, 6,000 uh, years of dispensations for mankind, plus one more year of 1,000 years for the reign of Jesus on the earth, making seven years. If he said it's seven years total, 7,000 years total, that's what he means. He doesn't mean 7,000 in one day. If you go back and study the time, the times where God has put a date for something to happen, it is to the day 100% of the time. You cannot find it where it's not on the day he called it to be. In my humble opinion, and in accordance with God's word, understand your Daniel's seventh week is paramount. Daniel's seventh week is revealed in Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 through 27, where Daniel is prayed, asking God to how asking God, how long are we going to keep us here, Lord, in this captivity? It's the two southern tribes that Daniel is praying for. And when are we going to be able to go back to Jerusalem? Last week we 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 talked about about a third of the about three quarters of the lesson. The rest of it I moved forward to this week. Go, Daniel, according to all your righteousness. I pray, let your anger and your fury, O oh Lord, according to all your righteousness. Daniel is praying. Let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem, from your holy mountain, because of our sins and for the iniquities of our fathers. Jerusalem and your people are a reproach to all of those around us. Now, therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant and his supplications, and for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. And Daniel 9, 18, O oh my God, incline your ear and hear. Open your eyes, God, and see our desolations in the city which is called by your name. For we do not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercy. Amen. We're here because of your mercy, God. not because of anything we've done. Note how quickly God uh, hears and responds. Now Daniel was, uh, he was uh, in nine, nine, 
9, 20, and 21, Daniel says, Now while I was speaking, while I was praying, in fact, and confessing my sin, confessing the sin of my people Israel, and presenting my supplications, my groaning and prayer, before the Lord my God, for the holy mountain of my God, yes, while I was speaking in prayer, Gabriel shows up. He's the one I'd seen in a vision at the beginning, caused to fly swiftly, reaching me about the time of the evening offering. And God's response, Daniel 9, 22, 23. And the angel informed me and talked with me and said, Oh, Daniel, I have come forth now to give you skill to understand. At the beginning of your supplications, the command went out. When did it go out? At the beginning of your prayer. When you pray, expect it to go out. Amen. Your prayer is working for you. Amen. Expect it to go out. A reply is coming. If you'll do it for Daniel, he'll do it for every one of us. And then Gabriel says... Uh, Or the angel says, I have come to tell you for you're greatly loved. Therefore, consider the matter and understand the vision. Last week, we asked this question. Whom will he teach knowledge? And whom will he make to understand the message? Just those weaned from milk or just drawn from the breast? For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line. Here a little, there a little. And I told you last work that line, the word line, does not mean a written word on the Bible. The line is a line to measure distance with. It can be used to plumb horizontally. It can be used to plumb vertically. What's he saying to us? My words and the revelation that you get have got to line up with my words. If I've said it, the revelation you get have got to be squared up and plumb with my words. Here a little, there a little. Proverbs 25, we, we talked about this last week. It's the glory of God to conceal a matter. But it's the glory of kings to search out a matter. God, in, 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 in my opinion, there are things that God conceals from us. And I think that he does it on purpose. Why? Because when we go start digging for the truth and searching out the truth, it shows him we place value on what he has said. It's our demonstration of placing value. God, why'd you put this down there? What, that doesn't make a lick of sense to me, Lord. Why'd you do it that way? Why didn't you do it this way? It made more sense to me. Son, just keep digging because you'll get a little here and a little there, a little here and a little there. Do you imagine giving a, a six-year-old child a loaded 38 pistol, automatic? That's what we'd be like if God would download all of the stuff that we think we've got to have. Because he does what? He grows us into his word. He grows us into his word. The human heart, in my humble opinion, was designed by God to grow his word. Let me say it again. The human heart was designed by God to, glow, to grow God's word. So Daniel 9.24 25, 26, and 27. Seventy weeks are determined for your people, the Jewish nation, 
and for your holy city, Jerusalem. This is about where we stopped last week. Continuing to read carefully, knowing with understanding these prophetic words have not yet been fulfilled. Seventy weeks or 430 years are determined for your people, the Jewish nation, and for your holy city, Jerusalem, to finish transgression, to make an end to sin. Look, the enemy has been judged and kicked out of heaven, but the enemy has not been stopped in his tracks. He will be at the second coming. That is exactly where he will be done with permanently. And there will be no more devil to deal with, except for a very short period right at the end of the millennium. To make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and property, uh, prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Last week when I gave you this list, I did not add the scriptural authority. This week you'll see the scriptural authority by each one of those. Notice, 70 weeks are determined. God the Father has decided, he made the decision, and he is assigned a given period for the people and for the holy city Jerusalem, all according to Daniel's prayer. But there's much, much more. Let's see if we can find it. Daniel 9.25 Now therefore, understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks, and there shall be sixty-two weeks, the streets of Jerusalem shall be built again, and the wall will be, be built again, but it's going to be in trouble sometimes. When you study Nehemiah and Ezra, you can learn about all of the details. But when does the command go forth to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince? The first decree... There were three decrees. The first decree was given during the first reign of Cyrus, king of Persia. And Cyrus was reading the, one of the prophets because when Israel went into captivity, captivity, they brought the book of Isaiah with them and they brought the book of Jeremiah with them. And so, Jeremiah, uh, so Cyrus is reading from uh, Jeremiah, uh, from, uh, Jeremiah and he saw his name there that God put there 200 years earlier. He said, well, that's me. God, that's me. I'm the one that's supposed to let your people go. Let's get on with it. And he gave him a decree at that point to begin to go back and build, go back to Jerusalem and build a city and build the walls. That was the first decree. Now his son reigned, and when his son took over the throne, all of the buildings stopped. That's in Ezra 4, 1 through 24. The second king was Darius, and he was reading Isaiah. And he saw his name the same way. My servant Darius, he is going to release my people and help them get back up to Jerusalem and build a temple and build the walls and the streets. So he made a second decree. And that played out, not, was not completed. But the next king was Artaxerxes. He reigned for 40 years. In the 20th year of his reign, 444 BC, he gave Nehemiah the third degree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Jesus. Messiah the Prince. This third decree was where the counting starts from. So at this point, we start at 400 
and 90 years, and we begin to subtract as the years go along. Okay? Seventy weeks or 490 weeks of years are determined, are determined upon your people and upon the holy city. That's how long you got to wait, Daniel. 490 years. That's how long you got to wait. And now you ask, how are the 70 weeks divided? So what does 70 weeks mean? The week in Hebrew, the week word is Shababa, and it means to be sevened. So if I have seven something, if I have seven weeks, it's actually seven times seven, 49 years. If I'm talking about days, it's days. But if I'm talking about weeks, they have to be sevened, according to Shabawa, to seven something. So if I have seven weeks to go do something, I multiply that times seven, and that's how long that's going to take me, or how long God has declared that's what I'm doing. So that has to figure in the total of the 70th week because all of that time was declared by God from our taxis letter and the, the permission to go until Messiah the Prince 490 years. If we're talking about time periods in terms of days, it means seven days, seven time periods of years. Therefore, if God declared 70 weeks has been determined, we can safely say, until Messiah, it's 490 years. That answers Daniel's question exactly to the year. They are divided into the three main periods. Now watch, stay with me. The first division is seven weeks. And seven times seven is equal to 49 years to rebuild Jerusalem. And that's when Cyrus's order and some soldiers went with Nehemiah and, and uh, Ezra to start rebuilding the walls and the city. So we have a period of 49 years. The second division is 62 weeks. So that means 62 times 7 equals 434 years. So Daniel has been told there's one period going to be of 7 years and another one then of 62 weeks. So we have 49 years to complete the walls and rebuild the city and 434 additional weeks, and I watch this, until Messiah is cut off. It doesn't say Jesus lives out the 70th week. Why? Because he came to his own, and his own received him not. The Jews wouldn't accept him. Rather, they put him on a cross and killed him so we have one year short seven weeks plus 62 equals 483 years we have seven years uncounted for the third division one week the final seven years of this age ending with the seven second advent of Christ is to fulfill the six events. So Jesus has declared, he was declared that Jesus would have 490 years and only 483 were fulfilled by Jesus. There's one week of years remaining. One week of years is seven years. And that's not been fulfilled. That has not been fulfilled. 
Jesus was cut off a week too early. Actually, a a seven-year period, one week, seven years too early. Okay, let's see what else we can find. And after the 62 weeks of Messiah, the 62 weeks, comma, Messiah shall be cut off. God tells Daniel, he's not going to make it. Daniel, not going to make it. But not for himself. The people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and sanctuary. The end of it will be like a flood and just keep on coming. Wars and rumors and wars will continue. The city and sanctuary to be destroyed by the Romans was predicted in Daniel 9.26. And we know from last week's teaching, the book of Luke records the destruction of Jerusalem. The 70th week is about to begin. It's just about to say time's back in. Now we're going to complete the time Jesus was allotted. Daniel 9.27, unfulfilled. Now watch this. Then he, and this is the first time we've heard about a he, then he, not, not, not Jesus, he, small he, shall confirm a covenant with many. That's the Jews. For how long? One week. Seven years. One week. Seven years. Let's keep going. What's the length of the covenant? Seven years. Many believe this is the Antichrist first introduced to us in Daniel 7, 25, 26. And here it is. He, this he, shall speak pompous words against the Most High. He shall persecute the saints of the Most High and shall intend to change times and law. Then the saints shall be given into his hand for a time and times and a half time. Time, one year. Times, two years. Half time, six months. We're talking about days, time, one day. Times, two days. Half day, and so on. Now that's in Daniel 7.25. The Hebrew word for time is idiom, and it means one year, so times two years. Half of time would be six months, or half a year. Now, the total of three and a half years is 1,260 days. So, is it possible that Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel? at an appropriate time in our future. And the covenant is going to be for seven years. And what we're going to find out is that as soon as this covenant starts, Israel is ready to go. What do I mean by that? Israel has already gathered together all of the instruments for sacrificial service to start animal sacrifices again, to start the law, to kickstart the law all over. Who's going to do this? The Jews. They've already got red heifers in Israel waited, waiting now. In fact, they were delivered about six or seven months ago from a cattle ranch in Texas And they're going through testing to make sure that the red heifers have the right genomes to be be sacrificed to God. 
That's all sitting in the wings. So this Antichrist comes in and he says, okay, now I'm ruling the world and a whole bunch of things are going to take place in the interim because he is going to be the, the one person that comes out of the Roman Empire and, and, and everybody else bows the knee to him. So the first thing he's got to settle is this whole Israel issue. So he makes a covenant and says, you guys go back and practice the law because I've got a few little problems up in the north. I, I've got a three, country, three kings up there that are driving me crazy. Gog and Magog and, uh, and uh, with Tuber and Michelle and I got to go take care of them. But as soon as I get them conquered, uh, then I'll be back and we'll talk about your covenant. In, da in Daniel 7, 9, 26, but the court shall be seated and they shall take away his dominion. A heavenly court with the Ancient of Days presiding to consume and destroy Antichrist dominion forever. Daniel 9, 26, 27, and 28. Then the kingdom and the dominion of Antichrist and the greatness of the kingdoms in the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High. Isn't that what it says? Black and white? He sh his kingdom, the kingdom of Jesus, will be an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Please remember, I told you last week, that procreation will not stop. Men and women are still going to be having babies and carrying on, and God's God's children are going to keep them right on being born just like they have been for the last 2,000 years. They don't stop. Oh, never heard that before. And the final part of 927, here's the last part. Then he, we know he's already formed a covenant for one week. Then he, Antichrist, Daniel 927, shall a confirm a covenant with many for one week, semicolon. But in the middle of the week, or after three and one half years, he shall bring an end to what? Sacrifice. So we know now they've been able to sacrifice, the Jews have, for three and a half years. The covenant was seven years long with Israel, made by Antichrist, but at the middle of the covenant, he steps in and stops it all. Why? Because he can't take it now, and he wants to put himself on the throne of God. And on the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate. Satan himself, even until this com consumption, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. That will take place at the end of the seven years, at the time that Jesus comes back to the earth to straighten it all out. And when he comes back to the second time, he's going to clean house. This verse also describes what will happen in the seventh year, the tribulation period of seven years. God sets this 70th year off by itself, and there's a gap between year 69 and year 70. Aren't you glad? How long is the gap? 2,000 years. It's called the time of the Gentiles. That's when we all got saved and born again. So from year 69, the 69th week, Jesus was cut off, but not for himself. 
So they, his own refused him. But the next verse says, but those who would receive him, he granted the right to become children of God. So for 2,000 years, us Gentiles, we've been receiving the kingdom of God. But the time of the Gentiles is just about to come to a screeching halt. When the rapture takes place, every believer on the earth will be gone. Cleaned house. Now it's the Jews and Antichrist. Do you know the church is not a, the church in Revelation one, two, and three, where uh, Paul, I mean, where uh, John is writing the letters to the church about their behavior, and that was probably written about ninety six uh, uh, A.D. somewhere around in there. Those have been in force all this time, but the time. That the, uh, that the rapture takes place, we revert to Jewish time, and the church is never mentioned after, ever, in Revelation, after Revelation chapter 3. Not another word about the church. Why? Because we ain't here. We've been gone. We've been with our king. And we've been given white horses. And we've been given robes of righteousness. Now those who barely got saved to the skin of their teeth, they'll have a gown of salvation. But us and we'll have robes of righteousness and white horses. And like two, three hundred, maybe a billion white horses riding behind Jesus with their swords drawn out. Whoa, whoa, what, a, what, an, what a, an intimidation factor. Well, I give up. And at that point, Jesus cleans house. How does he do that? With the judgment of the nations. That happens as soon as Christ comes back. The nations that blessed Israel will receive a reward. The, blessed, the nations who cursed Israel will not. Judgment of the nations. Okay. Okay. I think I mentioned this, but President Bush Sr., President Bush Jr., Obama, and Biden are all and all have been supporters of a one world government. Big time supporters. President Bush first was the one to introduce the whole idea of one world government. I know, broke my heart too. Now you might say all these conspiracy theories and, and how does all of this fit with the lesson? This verse also describes what will happen in the seventh year, the tribulation period of seven years. God sets this 70th year off by itself and there's a gap between year 69 and year 70. Aren't you glad? How long is the gap? 2,000 years. It's called the time of the Gentiles. That's when we all got saved and born again. So from year 69, the 69th week, Jesus was cut off, but not for himself. So they, his own refused him. But the next verse says, but those who would receive him, he granted the right to become children of God. So for 2,000 years, us Gentiles, we've been receiving the kingdom of God.
But the time of the Gentiles is just about to come to screeching halt. When the rapture takes place, every believer on the earth will be gone. Cleaned house. Now it's the Jews and Antichrist. Do you know the church is not a, the church in Revelation one, two, and three, where uh, Paul, I mean, where uh, John is writing the letters to the church about their behavior. And that was probably written about 96 uh, uh, A.D., somewhere around in there. Those have been in force all this time. But the time that the, uh, that the rapture takes place, we revert to Jewish time. And the church is never mentioned after ever in Revelation after Revelation chapter 3. Not another word about the church. Why? Because we ain't here. We've been gone. We've been with our king. And we've been given white horses. And we've been given robes of righteousness. Now those who barely got saved to the skin of their teeth, they'll have a gown of salvation but us and we'll have robes of righteousness and white horses and they, like two three hundred maybe a billion white horses riding behind Jesus with their swords drawn out whoa whoa what an what an in, what a an intimidation factor well I give up and at that point Jesus cleans house how does he do that with the judgment of the nations. That happens as soon as Christ comes back. The nations that blessed Israel will receive a reward. The, blessed, the nations who cursed Israel will not. Judgment of the nations. Okay, I think I mentioned this, but President Bush Sr., President Bush Jr., Obama, and Biden are all and all have been supporters of a one-world government. Big-time supporters. President Bush first was the one to introduce the whole idea of one-world government. I know, broke my heart too. Now you might say all these conspiracy theories and, and how does all of this fit with the lesson? Listen to Luke. And there will be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and on earth distressing nations with perplexity. The seas and the waves roaring. Men's heart will fail them from fear and the expectation of those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with great power and great glory. Now, these things, when they begin to happen, look up, lift your heads up, because your redemption draws near. Yeah, amen. And the church, and the church is taken out of here. But take to yourselves lest your hearts be weighed down with carousing and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day come on you unexpectedly. For it will come as a snare to all those who dwell on the face of the earth. Watch, therefore, and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The Laugh Application Bible says it this way. Jesus told the disciples to keep constant watch for his return. Nearly 2,000 years have passed since he spoke these words. 
the truth remains. Christ is coming again, and we need to watch to be about his kingdom business. Could this mean working faithfully the task God has given us? Yes. Could Paul be giving the church a roadmap toward peace of mind? Yes. You know about Philippians 4, 6, and 7. Even though these happen right before our eyes, if we're born again, we will, need, we will indeed be counted worthy. For the mysteryness, okay, now listen to me. For the mystery of lawlessness, lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he's taken out of the way. So we can't know who the Antichrist is until the one who restrains is taken out of the way. Who's the one that restrains? Your teacher's waiting for an answer. Who's the one who restrains? Who? The Jews? The church? Everybody believe the church is the one that restrains? Raise your right hand. You said it. You've got to raise your right hand. Anybody else believe the church restrainer? You missed the chance. Church is the restrainer. Hey. Oh. Well, she's heard the lesson about ten times. Listen. Holy Spirit can't restrain. Why? For two reasons. First of all, he doesn't have authority to restrain. He doesn't have authority on the earth. The church does. And we work co-minister with Holy Spirit because we have the authority. So we're taken out of the way. What would happen, because a lot of people, let me tell you something. Let's say that this were to take place on Tishri, uh 10 of 2024. Just say that it happened then. On the next Sunday... Willie won't be here, and Stephanie won't be here, and there'd be lines waiting to get in the door all around this church to find the reason that all the Christians are gone. The biggest revival in the history of mankind will be the day after the rapture. Mark my words, it will be. It will be. What would you think? What would you think if you were went driving out the, the day after the rapture and you're driving down the street and there's nobody in the neighborhood? Schools are closed. What happened to them? Well, we don't know. They were here yesterday, day before. Yesterday and our little kids were playing because they're all gone now. Where'd they go? And then, after the restrainer restrains, then the lawless one will be revealed after we're gone, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Now, in a few weeks, um, God willing, we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the events, specific events that line up to the rapture. The specific events that line up to the catching away of the saints. You guys have heard it all before and you all have your own ideas and I suspect if you're students of Hal Lindsey and, and, and some of the other great uh, men of God of the 60s and 70s, you've heard it from a lot of people. 
and we're going to be able to put some wheels on the gaps that you have today. And I know that you have some gaps today, but if you'll take the document home and if you'll go back and read what we put down, read it from your Bible in its context, it will all fit. It will all fit. Amen? Amen. Amen. All right. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that the Holy Spirit is the one who helps us understand the word. Your Bible says in John chapter 14, the Holy Spirit will tell us and remind us of the things that Jesus has said. The Holy Spirit will remind us of things that are to come. The Holy Spirit is there to teach us about future events. In Jesus' name we thank you, Lord. Amen. I came out of the Church of Christ, and I was bound up having to get born every week, and 34 years after running from God, I went to a charismatic Pentecostal church, 10,000 people in it. I saw things happen that I, I don't believe all that, but whatever they was got, I want it. So they prayed for me, laid hands on me, and went home. Nothing. Nothing. And in our backyard, we had a big swimming pool and uh, had a tiff putting greens and kind of a lawn around it. And I started walking around that swimming pool night after night after night. And finally, there was no grass growing there. <laughs> Seeking Holy Spirit. And the devil was saying, you'll never get it. You'll never get it. He's never going to let you. You'll never get any part of Holy Spirit. I was a, a principal of a very large high school, and I was going from one meeting to the next, and I'm in the, my van and going down, and I'm in between the 43rd... Uh, uh, 43rd in Glendale and, and, and my van is all of a sudden full of the glory of God and I can't tell you I can't tell you what that feels like or looks like but I knew if I did not pull over and park it I was going to kill somebody <laughs> and it was a Safeway parking lot and I pulled in that parking lot and we didn't have the back seats, and then I got it, and I laid out prostrate on the on the floor of the van, and I and began to pray, and it just came whoosh! All oh, God dumped it on me all at once, and the prayer language wasn't little bits and pieces, baby. It was full blown prayer language for oh, maybe an hour, and so. I looked at him and watched I said, man, I'm the leader and I'm not there. I jumped in the van and I got down one mile and there was a fresh fries supermarket and the van is filled again. Whoosh! And I get him in the same place and I stay prostrate this time till the Father was finished with me. You got to be a hard-headed cowboy for it to take that long. But man, man, oh man, oh man, oh man, was it blessed and was it great. And I have never, ever looked back. Not one little bit. Not one little bit. And he didn't treat me any differently than he would treat anyone in here. The only difference is he had more crap up here that had to be dislodged by something that would say, boy, you have just been dislodged. <laughs> That's not even a little lesson. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. 
for they are foolishness to the natural man. Why? His only frame of reference are the five senses. Amen? So he's wondering, what in the world are you talking about? If there's any evangelicals in here that have not received the Holy Ghost yet and been called cuckoo by all your friends, you need to get it because he's laying for you. And I'm just the one to lay hands on you and have you get blown right out of your chair. Hi, my name is Pastor Stephanie Steeler, and I'm the lead pastor here at Revival and Healing Ministry. And I want to tell you about what we're doing here. We have a pastor school that we train pastors in, as well as we bought a new campus uh, that needs a lot of reparations. And uh, please join our page and go to the donation page on our website and help us out to get this campus in order. And none of our pastors on the payroll here or on the roll here, and we've got seven pastors here, none of us get any salary or pay or getting paid for what we do here. So all the money is going to go back in the building and on our pastor's course. We don't charge a fee for our pastor's course. It's absolutely free and we give you the books and everything. We're not... Uh, school that teach people to be prophets. We teach people to go out and do the gospel of Jesus Christ in a quick word and to prepare people to help other people with their salvation. So if you feel it on your heart to donate something little to, the, to contribute to do this and make our campus look a little bit better, we bought this building for um, $88,000 and we are trying to fix it up. We're in a smaller city, and we it's just impossible to get a good bu building here. But with your help, we can change this building, and look it can look spectacular for the students and put more people out. So we are a church that teach and release. We Our ministry teach the people, and then we release them out there to go and do God's work.